so what's the difference between an epidural hematoma and a subdural hematoma? Requires a little bit of knowledge about the brain and uh, brain anatomy. So as you know, your brain sits um, covered with three layers of what we call meninges, which are basically three layers coating the brain, and then there's your skull. And um, so there's the brain, then there's what's called the pia matter, which most people will never see, then there's the arachnoid matter because it looks like a, a spider, and then there's the dura matter, which is a big fibrous material like paper that covers the brain, and then there's the skull. And normally the dura matter adheres to the skull so that it, there's they're tightly up beside each other. But running in between the skull and the dura mater are the arteries that supply the skull and the scalp and that kind of thing. And the big one that most people know about is called the meningeal artery, the middle meningeal artery that runs right through here. And so when you fall and you fracture your skull, uh, somewhere on this side often, you will tear the middle meningeal artery. The artery, because it's an artery, is under pressure and so it will continue to bleed and it bleeds quickly because it, it's under pressure. So you get a collection of blood between the skull and the dura mater, um, which is called why it's an epidural because it's above the dura, um, and, it collects, and it collects quickly. But the hallmark of an epidural hematoma is it tends to occur in people under the age of 45, and it tends to um, present with a fall, with a brief loss of consciousness. Person wakes up, perfectly fine, seems to be great, um, and, and not have any difficulties whatsoever. And uh, for an epidural hematoma on the side of the head, usually about an hour, two, three hours later, they start to get drowsy, they start to throw up, they start to have symptoms. And that's because at that point, the collection of blood in that space has gotten so big that it's now pushing the brain across in the skull and pushing the brain down into the skull and compressing the brain stem so that um, your heart um, becomes irregular, your breathing becomes irregular, and you're slipping into a coma, and if not treated, it'll eventually kill you. The other type of epidural hematoma is one where it occurs at the back of the brain where you fracture back here, and because it's right by the brain stem, which is the part of the brain that has to do with um, breathing and being awake and, and having your heart beat, um, that collection of blood will compress your brainstem um, faster, there's less space, and it's hitting the bad area or the area that's going to kill you much more quickly. So you will die from that kind of an epidural hematoma really very quickly. Um, but it's a very rare form and not recognized uh, very often. In a subdural hematoma, um, the veins of your brain uh, run in the space between the arachnoid and the dura, um, and they are under low pressure. So as you get older and you start losing your brain cells, um, by the time you're 45 or older, our brains have shrunk. So instead of the brains being tightly up against the skull, they're now somewhat pulled away. So there's a bit more space. And then, um, and then when you have your, your fall or the car accident or whatever, um, the brain gets jostled and it sort of moves like jello, so it runs from one side to the other side and it stretches those veins because they're stuck to the adherent to the dura on the other side. And so the veins stretch. Now if you've got too much space in your brain and they stretch, they'll stretch and tear and then they start to bleed but because it's a vein or low pressure, they tend to not bleed as fast and they tend to ooze a bit more. Um, and in, at the older you are, the more space you have for that blood to c accumulate. Sometimes subdural hematomas aren't recognized for weeks after the injury because it's taken that long for them to become symptomatic because they just slowly, slowly collect it. If you're 45 and you, and you end up with a subdural, you tend to be symptomatic a little bit faster because your brain hasn't shrunk as much, and so you don't have as much space, so you can, you can end up 
presenting with the headache and the nausea and the vomiting and the uh, cognitive changes with the subdural a faster period of time. But those are sort of the two main differences between them. Whereas a subarachnoid hemorrhage <laughs> is um, caused by the arteries within the brain um, and they run in the arachnoid space which was the middle layer uh, covering the brain and they um, can, the small ones can rip and tear when you have a trauma. Um, which gives you blood in the subarachnoid space, or of course you can have an aneurysm that ruptures and then have a big huge subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, which will, depending on where the aneurysm is, depends on what, how you present, um, and whether you end up with weakness down one side or whether you end up being blind or whether you end up having frontal lobe damage or combinations thereof. So that's sort of what a subarachnoid hemorrhage is. And then there's the intracerebral hemorrhage, which is where you get actual blood inside the brain parenchyma itself and that's usually caused by a direct blow to the brain or um, you've had like a stroke-like event so that there's a lack of blood to the brain for a part of the time and then the brain um, gets reperfused so there's blood again but there's nothing stopping it from leaking out so you get a big collection of blood and then finally there's the interventricular hemorrhages which is where you have the blood that goes into the ventricles which are the spaces within the brain where the cerebral spinal fluid is made um, and that puts you uh, gives you a bad headache and can put you at risk of developing something like hydrocephalus which is known as water on the brain which give you bad headaches and make you sleepy and put you into coma as well so those are the main types of bleeds in the brain.